Bigfoot researcher and author, a musician, a black hat wearing guy. I have to do my own inter uh, introduction, I guess. That's it. I was informed this morning that I'm also the MC. I'm the tour guide. I'm doing a presentation. I love this stuff, though. This is great stuff, you know. Wait, wait, wait. I aspire. Wait. wait. Check this out. This guy traveled all the way here. What is this? This is awful. <laughs> Seriously, this guy. If you are interested in foul, Boggy Creek, you don't know who this guy is, I'm not sure why you're here. This is a man. I mean, he brought the legend back to life, so to speak. He is a legend himself. When I call Lyle, well, I pretty much always know where he is. He's either in Texas or he's in foul, following up on something new in this region, which is really cool uh, because he has dedicated so much time and put in so much amazing work documenting this, this series of events that happened here. And he really, I, I'm serious, he really has brought this legend back to life. I remember this movie when I was a kid. It had a huge influence on me, just like lots of other cryptozoologists. And it's, uh, and it's one of the most significant films for people like us. So this is the man that dug into it and found so many details and so many facts that have been overlooked. Not only that, he's a phenomenal musician. If you haven't heard Google Town, go listen to it. Uh, it's, it's my preferred road music when I'm traveling around the world. And uh, all around... Fantastic guy, one of my best friends, and uh, a truly remarkable human being. Give a hand for Lyle Blackburn. Thank you, brother. The check will be in the mail, sir. So yeah, I've been looking into this for a long time, and you know, I, I never aspired to become part of the legend, but uh, it was something I was interested in, and something that uh, I just loved since I was a kid, so as an adult, I wanted to know the true story. It was something I, I wanted to pursue, and at first I was just doing it because I just wanted to know myself. I just wanted to do it. And I thought, well, I could write a book. Nobody's written a book yet, which was kind of amazing to me. With all the Bigfoot books out there, nobody had, had come back and written a, a book about the Fountain Monster, and I couldn't believe it. You know, I mean, Smokey... Crabtree had written about the Bat Monster, but that was more in terms of during his life story. But nobody had sat down to just sort of write a, a book dedicated to this. So when I started researching this back in around 2009, I think, was when I first started seriously looking into it as a, in the form of a book, you know, I started actually hurrying. You know, I was like, man, you know, I'm sure Ken Gerhardt's probably working on this right now. I better hurry the first black hat to, to be able to put this book out. Um, so, you know, it's gone on since there, since then, and today I want to talk about what is the reality of the Falk Monster? I mean, you know, we, we talk about it in terms of the film and in terms of a legend, but, but what is the reality? Could something like that truly exist just miles down the road, just in these woods out here, can it really, can it really be something to this legend? Let's see. They told me this worked. <laughs> okay, it doesn't. It never works. That's okay. Here comes Eric Daniel. He can solve all problems. It's probably not on or no bad. It doesn't matter. I just want to think. Anyway, so, you know, we know there, there's the movie, the iconic poster, The uh, Wooden On. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> this is what happens. That's why I don't have the good thermal image or the good thing. I tried. I swear, I, I had it on when I pointed it at that creature. This is the curse of Bigfoot. The camera doesn't work. You know, something went funky with it as it ran across the road. But anyway, so there, there's these things that have come out, and I'm sorry I dominate this screen because now I've written three books that have sort of uh, encompassed this, as well as the documentary we did with Seth and Small Town Monsters, and of course there's Smokey's book, 
Um, all of these things perpetuate the stories and the legends. We all know that there's sightings of Bigfoot all across North America. And here's a map. I, I don't know how accurate this is. I mean, you know, I was in New Mexico and it, it only shows one lonely Bigfoot there. But even I, I've actually personally interviewed more than one witness. So that, that can't completely be right. There's got to be at least two or three there. Uh, but but it, it just gives you a sense of, of where they are, and it makes a lot of sense because this is the drier plains area, the flat, arid zones, and places where they just couldn't exist without being found, it, you know. But the more you have these forested areas, certainly in the Pacific Northwest, where traditionally we first knew of Bigfoot or Sasquatch stories, as well as over here in the east. So there's tons of Bigfoot reports all around. And, you know, <clears throat> luckily this is one of the we most well-known of stories. Uh, and certainly what represents Southern Bigfoot is about the legend of Boggy Creek. And that's because, fortunately, Charles Pierce uh, made a movie. But, but you know, we're going to talk specifically here. Could that creature exist here? And a lot of people doubt whether Bigfoot could exist in the South anyway. Because you think about it, when you first heard of Bigfoot, it was probably in terms of, it wasn't the legend of Boggy Creek, it was in terms of the Pacific Northwest. You're like, oh yeah, I've never been to Washington, but uh, there's mountains and stuff, and forests and woods, and, and, and you know, uh, Mount Rainier, all these places where, yeah, something like that definitely exists up there. The Native Americans have talked about it. And, and, you know, that was the mindset early on. Um, but, but all the while, reports of wild men and other things that proliferated even in the south. And certainly are near about the habitat around here. Now, how many folks have actually been out in the woods here, like in the Sulphur River Bottoms, Mercer Bayou, looked around? You know, a number of you. If you haven't, it, it's just a, a wonderful place. And here's a good aerial view of this, and this is just a, a small section, a, a small snapshot of what's out there. And the Sulphur River Wildlife Management Area is almost 20,000 acres of remote, rugged bottomlands. And this is the place where Boggy Creek feeds into, eventually, all these networks of waterways. The, the, the bus tours go by where the, the little Boggy Creek starts, and then eventually it winds around Fowl and goes up and feeds into the Sulphur River bottoms and these winding bayous. And if you just kind of look at that, if you go out there, there's no people. You may find a hunter or two, or you may find me out there, or some other Bigfoot researcher, but generally, there's no one out there. And, and, and it's just very dense, very wooded, and in fact, this is one of the largest bottomland hardwood habitats remaining in the Red River Valley. Everybody knows the Red River. This is a major river basin that flows down through this area, and Boggy Creek and the Sulphur River bottoms are all part of that. So that, that's a good place to start if you're going to look for big animals that may live there. It's wild and it's certainly untamed. Denny Roberts down at the Moss Party says this is wild country. I love that. That's what it is. It's wild country and a perfect place, in my opinion, where if these creatures exist, they could certainly live there. It's a perfect place to hide an unknown animal. Here's just a snapshot I took of Mercer Bayou on one of the many times I've been there. And it's just there's a lot of water. The habitat, uh, you know, certainly where there's water, rainfall, there's foliage, where there's foliage, there's things to eat, there's lots of animals, uh, wildlife, an abundance of different types of food. Swampy areas have some of the, uh, the best food sources. You know, you think about that. There, there's amphibians, there's insects, there's plant matter, and certainly there's uh, small, you know, everything from mice to cougars and anything else that perhaps 
an apex predator like the Ralph Monster could dine on. It's pretty much like a buffet. It's like the Golden Corral for Bigfoot. I don't generally eat a lot of stuff out of the bayou, but you could. When you look at this, you kind of zoom out a little bit. You, you know, you got to think about this in terms of reality. You know, okay, well that's great. We got a big chunk of land down there, but but large animals seem to roam in 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 terms of a lot of square miles. If you were to tag a bear or a cougar or something like that, you're gonna you could find them, uh, you know, miles, a hundred miles away. And that's what they do, they roam, they go in the, in the best places at the best times of year to find food sources or shelter or whatever it is they need. So certainly a big creature like this can't just have a small area, it has to be fully encompassing. And in fact, this area is, is that. And I've, I've mapped out what I call the Caddo Triangle. Because, you know, you got the Bermuda Triangle I always thought that was super cool. I'm like, we need our own triangle down here. What kind of triangle can we have? The Caddo Triangle. And if you look at it, it's it's an area where. Let's see if this has a point. I can't point at the screen. I can point randomly or some more. Anyway, who's been to Jefferson, Texas? That's the Bigfoot capital of Texas. Well, that's only about a 45-minute drive down the road from here. And when you drive the back roads, you're going through the woods. You just keep driving going, I thought I was going to get out of Falcon Bigfoot territory. I'm still in it. You go over Bayou, the bayous in Louisiana, Bayou Bacow over here. I never say that right. I try. I'm not a Cajun and back up to Mercer Bayou. Within that tri triangle, just right there, you have an interconnected highway of waterways, swamps, and woodlands where a creature like this could very well roam and exist. So while I've got a lot of stories here that's the Falk monster, I have stories just down there in Caddo Lake called the Caddo Critter. And I've written about this in various books um, it's interesting swamps. I talk about the Caddo Triangle. Well, you know, the Bigfoots don't care what you call them. They're not like, I'm a Texas Bigfoot. Dude, I'm an Arkansas Bigfoot. You know, I'll kick your butt. And Arkansas can, you know, kick our butts in football and things, maybe. But the Sasquatch doesn't care what you call it. And just because it, uh, uh, something is called the foul monster doesn't need, mean it stays here. It could roam where it wants. I'm like, dude, you can go where you want. You're big and you're hairy and you're kind of mean looking. You can go where you want. So, so in reality, the creatures that are seen here in foul could move along south to Caddo and be seen there just as well. And I mean, not to mention that there's a proliferation of sightings all through here. Like Oklahoma, eastern Oklahoma, tons of sightings. You know, all up in Arkansas, and certainly Louisiana, all the way down to the Honey Island Swamp Monster, and then East Texas, a lot of piney woods. And, and that, that reinforces the reality of the possibility that these creatures could, could exist here. Because that gives them plenty of place to roam. Plenty of place not only to find sustenance, to exist, but to stay elusive. If hunters are getting too thick up here in Falk, they just move along a little bit. Get out of the area. Be safe. Oh, I gotta also mention that perhaps not coincidentally, the Caddo Triangle has been the inspiration for two of the best Bigfoot movies ever made. Certainly, The Legend of Boggy Creek, or Survive Boggy Creek, but also, Creature from Black Lake. Has anybody seen Creature from Black Lake? 1976, great movie, one of my favorites. Uh, that was filmed in part in Caddo Lake, because Caddo Lake looks so cool. It looks like, when I, anytime I'm in Mercer Bayou or Caddo Lake, I just keep expecting to see a dinosaur. <laughs> I haven't yet, but I'm still hoping. 
And those were inspired by the Creature from Black Lake movie. The producer literally said that it was inspired by stories of a big hairy creature in Bayou Botcow, which is the other point of the triangle. So not only do we have actual real witness reports of sightings, we have these two great movies that came out of this area. Now, if these creatures exist now, we have to presume that they have existed all along. They had to have been here not just when we showed up, when settlers from Europe and other places, or the French, or, or whomever, that the, that the Native Americans, the indigenous people, would have seen them. And if you look to their tales, they have stories of what they call lost giants. Specifically, the Caddo Indians, for whom that lake area was named for, have stories of this creature that fits more or less the description of Bigfoot. Upright, forest people, uh, things to be respected, it's this tribe of people, lost giants, giants implies big. And so you can certainly find that in Native American tales, so that's good. Okay, yeah, they've been here. News reports from the 1800s document creatures that uh, people said existed uh, during that time. And David Weatherly just talked about some of those, those reports from uh, the mid-1800s, specifically in Arkansas. Okay, so that's good, that's building our case. Now, previously, if, if you look on the internet, according to the internet, and we all know the internet is 100% correct, <laughs> sightings of the foul monster date back to 1940s. That's, that's when mentions of it were made, and some of the reports in 1971 in the newspaper said that there was an incident in 1946, which there was. But when I came up here to start researching, then I started to uncover sightings that data back even further. And give or take, the earliest sighting that I have that you know says this person saw something goes back to 1908. So that's going back pretty far. And in that very first sighting, which is mentioned very briefly in one of the 1971 Texarkana Gazette articles, Willie Smith said that his sister saw it when she was around 10 years old. And I've heard this story from others, and they said that they were out fishing down by Mercer Bayou, and this little girl, Kate, went playing around in the bushes of the woods and came back saying, I saw a big, a big gorilla or an ape over there, a big hairy thing. Of course, in 1908, nobody's like, what, you know, gorilla? Go, go play over there, keep playing over there. <laughs> Nowadays, you're like, you can't get out of my sight, especially if there's gorillas. But back then, you know, kids played in the woods, but this girl had said she had seen some kind of an ape-like creature, which established a good starting point in the modern times that perhaps something is out here in the woods about that we don't know what it is. And then certainly, you know, there was the, the sightings that made the newspaper starting in 1971. That's when the Ford incident happened, and that made the Texarkana Gazette. And then here comes all the stories. Not only the sightings that were going on right there in the early 70s, but then the old-timers are like, dude, this isn't the first time we've heard this. I don't think they said do, but I think the first time we heard about this, back in the 60s, there had been a lot of sightings down in an area called Jonesville. And in Jonesville, it's even closer to the Sulphur River, back in the Sulphur River bottoms. And this is where the incidents involved some of the crab trees. Smoky Sun Lynn Crabtree had a dramatic encounter in 1965 which drew his family into this whole mystery. And so all these stories started coming out. So you had a proliferation of sightings in the 60s and 70s. And that's what inspired Charles Pierce to end up making the movie. 
and, and the movie roughly goes from uh, the late 50s to 1971 and captures that time period. And of course, that's when your average person or even some average Bigfoot researchers think, oh, that all happened back in the 70s. But of course, as, as you studied this or know or if you've read any of my books, you know that it continued on. Sightings continue to this present day. On the tour, I just we just literally drove right over an area where uh, two citizens who live here had reported a sighting less than two years ago. So it's something that's timely, something that's continued, and something again that builds our case that something strange is in these woods. So let's you know you need some evidence. What evidence do we have? And most people. You know, say, well, I don't believe in Bigfoot. There's no evidence. Have you ever heard of footprints? That that doesn't mean there's solid proof, but that is potential evidence. You know, physical impressions left behind by these creatures. And we're all aware that there's a lot of Bigfoot tracks out there, and a lot of them have been taken over the years. Some of them better than others. But here in in the area of Falk, there's been some good footprints. Back in 1971, a number of footprints were found in and around Boggy Creek, back on the bean field that owned by Willie Smith, that looked to be three-toed tracks. And this one here is a three-toed track taken by, this is owned by Tom Zorn, uh, a guy who lives here. Uh, and this shows that, that sort of three-toed track, it's, it's kind of vague, and if you look at that, it's actually down from Monster Mart. Check it out. Um, the three toed track is something that was perplexing. What kind of creature has three toes? Certainly it sounds monstrous. It is the foul monster. But in terms of reality, primates all have five digits, five toes. And that's necessary for balance. The anatomy is, is perfect for a, a large creature. So whether these three toed tracks really represent the creature or not, uh, is under debate even still. But there has also been five toe tracks found. And this one was found in 2004 by Doyle Holmes down in the bottom part of the Mercer Bayou. And Doyle, I have no doubt that this is a track. He didn't manufacture this. This is not made up. He found a trackway down there while he was scouting around with his hunting areas. And this, a cast of this, you can see back there on, it's on Jerry's table, close to my table. Check it out. It's a good track. Um, a hog stepped in it between the time when he found it and was able to get back down there with uh, some cement to cast it because uh, you can only get to this area by boat. This is not a very great picture because it's covered in water, but it's a track that uh, my late friend Tom Shirley and I found in 2015 uh, during a rainy period. That was the only time I've actually been spooked. People ask that, ask me that all the time. Aren't you scared to go out in those woods, you know, almost by yourself or with one other person? Eh, it's all right. I've been hunting since I was a kid, but on this particular night, uh, we were we had camped at Smith Park and we were walking around in some areas that we hadn't been before, and uh, we were, we found this. It was almost like a tunneled out track, uh, I mean tunneled out area where there was a kind of a two rut road. It almost looked like ATVs had gone down at one time, and. Uh, we, we walk by this all the time and never notice it. I said, hey, it looks like a tunnel. Well, we go in there and there was this little road. And it was probably midnight, it was, the moon was up a little bit, and we were just walking down it, just seeing what we could see. And we're always kind of looking for footprints, but we were walking in the dark. And I was ahead, and Tom all of a sudden said, hey man, come here. And he had flipped on his flashlight just at this particular time, and I, I said, yeah. You know, I walked back over there, and we looked, and it was in a puddle, and it, and it was perpendicular to the road, as if something stepped and then stepped back onto the 
uh, ground and into the trees. And I looked down there and I saw, I said, he goes, what do you think that is? I said, that looks like the quintessential fat monster track. It, it either has three or four toes. And it, it, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't find any other explanation. And that was the only time when I realized, what the hell are we doing? Because we're out here in the middle of nowhere. No one knows where we are. We didn't tell anybody. We barely have our lights on. And it, it, the scenario in my mind was that whatever made this track could have walked by here, you know, 30 minutes ago as it passed. And it only would leave the one track because when, you get, when you're not stepping in the mud on that little tra trail, you wouldn't leave tracks. I mean, I stomped up on there and you couldn't leave any more tracks. But it did where it stepped if that was one of the creatures. And I thought, wow. You know, this thing could be just watching us from the trees. Right there. So that was the one time where I thought, oh, you know, the reality of this, the reality, it's, it's exciting. I've seen the movie, but if I saw a seven foot tall bipedal ape like creature weighing four or five hundred pounds just looking at me right there in the dark out in those woods, you know, that would have been stark reality. So over the years, you know, there's been other there's been other tracks and there's some down at the monster marks. Maybe again, some are better than others. They don't prove the creature, but they're good indications that, you know, perhaps uh, it has left tracks, you know, if, if there is something to show for it. We got to ask the other questions. Do we have hair, hair samples, scat samples? I mean, if it's a living creature, it's got to leave, leave something behind. You know, and, and there's been rumors, you know, I, somebody found a hair, this and that. Somebody stepped in some scat <laughs> or whatever, but... To this day, you know, there hasn't been anything that has come out of this area that has, that, that can't be proven something else, you know. Some hair was shown to be bare. Okay, good try. Um, thus far, we don't have anything from here that, that would, uh, you know, we could say came from an unknown creature. DNA, you know, likewise, we would require you know, something physical to source the DNA from, but then we don't have a type specimen to compare it to, which is the conundrum of all of all the Bigfoot uh, research currently, because without that type specimen, the best you can ever say is, well, we don't know what it is. We're going to need a specimen, however that happens, to compare it to ultimately. So we're still looking for things like DNA, in general with Bigfoot, and certainly in the case of the foul monster. Photos, you know, that's another thing. People ask, are there any photos of the foul monster? Well, you know, I've heard a lot of stories over the years. Man, my dad got the game camera from my dad's cousin's niece, uncle. Dude, he got this picture, you gotta see it. Like, oh yeah, man text it to me or whatever, email it to me. No picture. Oh my God. You know, there's a lot of rumors like that. And, a, a, and I've seen a few where they actually got to me, and here's one here uh, that, you know, supposedly shows the fat monster, but I, I've done some research and some blow-ups, and I'm pretty sure that's a person. It looks very Bigfooty. Uh, but ultimately inconclusive as to what that is. But that's okay. It doesn't because we don't have a photo with a foul monster doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Because the subject here is going to be extremely hard to photograph. It's not going to pose for a glamour photo down at the mall. I've seen a few Bigfoot looking characters at the mall, don't get me wrong. But the Fount Monster, for all the reports that you have, it's always a, a brief and fleeting incident. Like all Bigfoot things. Well, everybody's got a cell phone with a camera, how come you can't get a picture? 
when you got drive down the road, your cell phone out, ready, ready to go, you know, or when you're walking through the woods, hiking and hunting, your sighting is brief. It could be merely seconds. It bounds across the road in front of you. By the time you get the phone out and start trying to take a picture of it, it's gone. So it's not really a problem to me that you don't have a, a photo, at least on a phone. And ultimately, is a photo going to really be proof? You know, we, we got it. We got a photo. There's a photo. Does that prove? No. Even if that is the top monster. And with today's technology to Photoshop and to manipulate digital images, you know, even if it's super clear, you'd still have scientists go, hey, you know, that's just fake. You know, Hollywood did that. So, you know, we're going to need more than that, but a photo would be great. And if you do take a photo of the Falcon Monster, definitely send it to me. Or if your dad's cousin's niece, uncle, twice removed, took a photo of the Falcon Monster, I'll accept that as well. Then there's photos on gaming cameras. Do we have any of those? Again, I've heard a few incidents stories where people said they got one on game camera, and certainly there's a lot of game cameras out here. But game cameras have been traditionally poor sources for capturing images of Bigfoot creatures, even where there's a lot of sightings. Sometimes you get a vague looking thing, you know, where people flip it upside down and go, look, it's a, it's a Yeti doing a somersault. You're like, I don't know about that. But the thing about the game cameras is this. Animals can avoid those things. When you go in the woods and you put a manufactured product out there that's sitting there deep in the woods, it's completely out of place. They can know it's there. And believe it or not, there was a study called The Wariness of Coyotes to camera traps relative to social status and territory boundaries. A study was titled that. I'm going to title my next book that, and it will not sell. That's the name of the study, but it sounds scientific, right? And it was. And what this study showed that when they put these game, game cameras out, the alpha male coyotes would actively avoid them. They, could, they were smelling them, sensing them, whatever, hearing the frequency, and they would go around them. So I'm thinking, well, if a coyote can sense this thing and avoid it, presumably a Bigfoot could. The Falk monster is going to know what's up and avoid it. So that, that, you know, that, that means the game cameras are something that uh, is not a guaranteed way to capture an image. It's certainly a great thing to do, and the more you put out there, the more chances we have that we might get it on camera, but it may be that they're simply avoiding them. Not to mention that if these creatures exist, the population has got to be very small. And so your chances of getting them, you saw the, the aerial photo how many game cameras are you going to drop out there? You'd have to drop a lot because there is a lot of miles and miles of forestry and acres where you could put these cameras. The other thing is these, these animals would conceivably be designed to blend in to their environment. When you get reports of Bigfoot, reports of the foul monster, oftentimes people will tell you it's dark, brown, it was black, it was reddish, you know, even auburn, various shades and things. Um, and, you know, you know that animals are just designed to blend in. That's their survival techniques because, you know, we're, we're pretty much an apex predator uh, other than people, you know, you're more scared of people than you are animals. When you're, when you're an animal in the woods, your whole entire survival depends on getting food and staying away from things that want to kill you. And so nature has 
designed them that way. The coloration of their fur is designed to blend into the background. And even the counter shading in the fur is on purpose. I mean, animals are beautiful and they look great, but that fur is designed for them to blend in. And people attribute supernatural qualities to the creature. Man, it was there and it just disappeared. It must have shimmered into another universe. No, it simply just stepped out into a shadow and its coloration make it impossible to see. You can walk through the woods and almost step on a snake and unless you just look at it, you don't see it. Now granted, those are small, but there are patterns and their coloration is designed to hide them. And just think about things like uh, chameleons, they change colors. So, you know, this, these creatures can have, you know, amazing natural qualities that make them extremely hard to see and extremely hard to find. That's the design. So it's not necessarily something where you know, you know, armadillos or whatever. Look, hey, what's up? You know, go through the woods. Check me out. I got a shell. I'm gray all over. These creatures would be much more uh, adept and difficult to see. And in fact, I always look at this when I'm driving down one of those roads. If you look over there, 15 yards into there, you're like, something could stand there, and I know, and I wouldn't even see it especially if it didn't move. That's an important thing. You think when you're, when you want to hide, you know, you gotta jump over here and hide and get out of the way. I was on some uh, training exercises with some Marines, and I learned that the real technique is just don't move. If I'm coming down there and I'm moving my eyes across here, what's gonna make, what's gonna catch my eye? Movement. If you stand perfectly still, and these Marines could stand there, and they would put a little twig in their hair, in their hat, which they said broke up their shape, and they would stand perfectly still. And I was looking right at the dude, and I couldn't see him until he moved. And I'm like, ah, oh, there he is. And that got me thinking, man, that's the techniques that these creatures could use. They may run across the road, but if they blend in and just stand still, you would have to look directly at them in this mile of forestry before you'd see them. And that makes them very hard to photograph and very hard to find and very hard to prove. Another thing that gives them an advantage is speed. We're always underestimating Bigfoot's potential speed. You know, I mean, we kind of think of, of this lumbering creature, you know, like, Harry and the Hendersons, he's kind of goofy, or even even the Patterson Gimlin film, you know, it's kind of walking along, but check me out, look back up here. I'm gonna keep walking. I don't care if Bob Gimlin's got a rifle. I'm a Bigfoot. You know, but the, the reality of this is a lot of people will, will give you reports that talk about how fast it bounded across the road or darted out of sight or moved quickly. Even on sometimes people say it moves on all fours. So potentially they can move very quickly, very fast and get out of the way. They're not lumbering there. They're not, you know, at a disadvantage. Uh, you know, they, they can move quickly as you know other animals can too. When animals need to move, they can move. And those sightings only last for seconds, in which you may catch a glimpse of them running across the road. Now, one incident that that I talk about that kind of pertains to this area where one of these creatures was seen running and running pretty quickly happened uh, during, while we were filming a TV show down in Falk, and this was back in April of 2013. Uh, we were filming a show called Shipping Wars. And don't ask me why I was on Shipping Wars. <laughs> but uh, it was this whole thing about how my friend Steve Boosie bought the remnants of the Minnesota Iceman display from Minnesota for his Museum of the Weird in Austin, Texas. 
So it was a big thing on the show where they transport something. So they thought it's a Bigfoot theme. We want to stop off and, and we want to uh, do a Bigfoot investigation. So there was this whole thing, watch the episode, you know, Steve, I'm going to call my friend Lyle Blackburn, we're going to stop in Fowl, Arkansas, which was cool because when they fought Bigfoot on this route, what did they think of? Fowl. Naturally, they called me, I, I called Ken Gerhardt and said, if I'm going to be on Shipping Wars, you're going to be on Shipping Wars. And we'll be on at the same time, we'll confuse everybody. Because he wears the black hat. But if you notice in that, I wear my uh, camouflage hat, so you can tell us apart. Uh, I did that for your, so you wouldn't be confused, thank you. But anyway, so we were filming down here in Jonesville at a friend of mine's property, literally in a place where there was a sighting back there by Terry Sutton in 1982. You know, have you seen the documentary Boggy Creek Monster, the small town of monsters film? The guy I talked to that's wearing the blue shirt, my number one witness right there. We, we took him out to that property, and of course it was the female driver of the that was on the show. We were like, let's scare the crap out of her, man. This is great. And she was like, Bigfoot. <laughs> you won't you think Bigfoot. We took her out there and as they were filming, the TV crew was kind of chuckling and hey, hey, you know, the usual Bigfoot this and that or whatever. Well, one of the guys was over there getting what's called B-roll. And that's all this, the background stuff that they can edit in. You know, you'll see me for five seconds talking and then it's trees and stuff. He's filming the B-roll and it was getting dusty. And he said, all of a sudden I'm filming way back in there. He said, I, it was so thick I couldn't, you know, it couldn't move very easily. He said he saw this figure running at him diagonally. And as it, as it got close enough, he said it was upright, it was running on two legs, it was dark all over, and he's just seeing through the camera. And he said, I, I just filmed this whole thing. I filmed it. And it ran, and it ran by and zipped off into the woods. Now this guy said, there is no way a person could run. And it's certainly so, because back there it's super thick. You can't run. You know, you're doing your best to walk and find the best path of least resistance. You can't run. He filmed this whole thing. He said it was moving extremely fast. And of course, when he, that was all the B-roll he was going to shoot, he got back out of there. And suddenly, I didn't see that. I saw all the, the crew kind of bringing all the equipment back towards the, the, uh, the band. Like what, what's going on? And Steve said, "I think one of them saw a big saw the fountain monster." I'm like, "Are you serious?" And then there there was no more chuckles after that. <laughs> like, See, I told you. And and so you know we proceeded to do the night investigation and all that. And some weird stuff. We heard some stuff, and the girl really was kind of spooked out, and then she had enough of Falcon. <laughs> Like, adios, and that was the show. But when the show came out, there was no, that, whatever William, the, the guy, the cameraman filmed, was not in the show. And I talked to him since then, and he goes, I don't know why they didn't put that in there. So, actually, there could be moving video of the foul monster sitting on the cutting room floor, so to speak, at this network. And it just goes to show you, they never put in the good stuff. It's like, you know, then they got to cut to some guy making fun of Bigfoot or whatever. On the show, I'm like, dude, you might have filmed one. Why isn't that in there? We've never been able to see the footage or anything like that. But I guess my long roundabout point here was that the thing was moving really fast. And so fast that he couldn't quite make out what it was. Which is the, to the advantage of these creatures. Now, if these creatures are down there, do they make knocks and howls? Are there signs of them, other signs? You've seen the shows. How many of you... What? Yeah. Yes, if you're uh, scheduled for the 3.30 bus tour, your bus will be leaving soon. This announcement brought to you by Greg Woolheater. 
Fried Craig's new meat cookies. <laughs> he was eating a hamburger bun, just flat out plain, no, or I mean a hamburger patty. I said, looks like a meat cookie. I got monster sauce, Craig's gonna come out with meat cookies. I, I think that's good. Thanks for being in my presentation. I'll give you the synopsis later. Yeah, yeah. At my booth. Uh, anyway, yeah, I mean, so how many of you ever been out in the woods and howled, made a howl? How many of you ever made a wood knock? All right, yeah. Well, you know, you got to do something when you're out there, right? You do. I mean, why not try to elicit something? But certainly in the case of the Fountain Monster, there have been reports of wood knocks, a friend of mine, John Attaway, was out one evening trying to retrieve one of his game cameras down, and it was it was a night when a big storm was coming. Lightning was flashing, and this storm was imminent. He's like, man, if I don't get that camera, it's going to be destroyed. So he drove down to Mercer Bayou, ran out there. The bayou was was almost dry. He ran down there, and he said, he, he, where he parked his car, he got to the camera, un you know, unhooked it, started back, he heard this big old huge knock between his car and where he was now. And he said, man, it was chilling because he said that was just something made that noise. And I've been down to this, there is nobody down there, especially when there's a big storm, rainstorm imminent. So he's a woodsman, he's a hunter. He said, I don't know what made that knock. So that was a good, uh, in my mind, suggesting that the creatures here do make knocks. Some people report Bigfoot's throwing rocks. Uh, you know, that's something you hear frequently. I don't particularly know of any incidents, credible reports that the foul monster has been throwing rocks at people. Uh, so, you know, I don't know about that. I, I don't think he really needs to. I mean, he's got a movie where he's already shown that he can be mean and dangerous. If you're sitting on the toilet, look out. He doesn't need to throw rocks. Howls? There's certainly some howls. I was just down up here three weeks ago, went down to a woman's property, which is pretty far south toward what's called Doddridge. And down there is super thick super wooded, she had sent me this howl, a bone chilling howl that just, you know, the quintessential Bigfoot howl. And I said, wow, that, that, you know, that sounds very promising and something that I've heard from time to time. People have sent me recordings from around here that are basically unidentified vocalizations. Now there's stuff down there that makes a lot of weird noises birds, foxes, coyotes certainly, uh, cougars make weird screams, but all those are fairly identifiable, and if you're out there, you've heard them all and can identify them, the range of sounds. Uh, these howls are just something that uh, we can't identify. And I was down there once, it was 2014, I was down there with my late research partner, Tom Shirley, uh, and we heard a similar howl we had taken the canoe out on Mercer Bayou and we were out there paddling around and it was like midnight, 1 a.m. or whatever. And we hear this, this howl come up. And when you're paddling in the bayou at night, there's a lot of ambient noise. If you've ever been out in the swamp at night, you just hear the insects, the frogs. And when you're paddling in the canoe, it's making noise in the duckweed. So, you know, I heard it and I'm like, I kind of stopped so I could focus in. And fortunately, it did it again. It was like 100 yards away or so, came up and I'm like, is that the weirdest coyote you've ever had, heard? Tom said, that ain't no coyote, which I pretty much knew, but I needed that reassurance. We waited about 45 seconds, then we heard it again. This thing rose up in the dark out of the bayou. I'm like, dude, that's it right there. Whatever this thing is, we don't, you know, it's not a normal animal. 
when I heard this lady's recording, it was very similar. And I've heard others like it from this general area. Again, this isn't something that can prove the foul monster, but certainly something that suggests there's some unidentifiable thing out there. And if there are a living, breathing population of creatures, they, they need to communicate for whatever reason, or even if they're howling in distress, or for whatever reason, they're gonna make some noises, just like the other animals do. So perhaps those clips of audio that come up every once in a while are actually the vocalizations of these creatures. And this, this kind of stuff goes back to my predecessor, Smokey Crabtree. You know, he was the foul monster guy, and back in the 60s, they, they were out there doing monster hunts, and they, they recorded some unidentifiable howls. They were using a wounded rabbit call to elicit these responses. And uh, part of that recording uh, and others were actually used, incorporated with other sounds, to produce the howl that you hear in the legend of Boggy Creek. And Charles, Charles Pierce always played that up, that what you hear is the actual recorded sound. We didn't make that up. It's a conglomeration, but he was a, I mean, he was a great uh, promoter of this. And it's cool, even if only part of it uh, is real. But certainly you hear these things uh, out there at night. Another thing I guess I should add is the whole gifting. Have you heard of the gifting of Bigfoot? Well, a little big, Bigfoot. Uh, I always say, machete don't text, fountain monster don't gift. So if you leave a toy out there or whatever an offering, you don't care. I don't have any credible or reports of the gifts exchange with a fountain monster. Uh, he don't play that, so. In order for these creatures to exist, we have to presume they have above average intelligence for a wild creature, wild animal, whatever they may be. They have to have that because it's logical that if they've evaded proof all this time, it can't be just by dumb luck. You know what I'm saying? There has to be some thought pattern to this, whether it's, uh, you know, trying not to leave footprints, whether it's, uh, you know, don't die on somebody's back porch, <laughs> perhaps even burying their own dead, or, or moving into the, to the deep woods when they sense that their time is short. You know, something like that, and don't, you know, don't run across the roads too much. Give them a little, but don't always run across the roads. Don't run across Highway 49, please. Run across the little county roads back in the woods. So, you know, this is the only way for them to conceivably exist and that makes a lot of sense because if they have the intelligence to kind of stay away from us and who could blame them for that then that would afford them uh, the longevity for staying unproven and unknown you know they, they, they can use that to their advantage so I, I think that the foul monster for his, all the fame and the craziness of the movie that the creatures are are intelligent now, people try to dismiss all of this with a few different theories. First, we have the circus train wreck. Has, it, has anybody ever been in a circus train wreck? <laughs> I keep asking that, nobody ever raises their hand. Well, circus train wrecks are apparently prevalent. Everywhere I go to investigate a cryptid, somebody tells me there was a circus train wreck. Apparently, circus trains were terrible at staying on the tracks. You know, I went to South Carolina to investigate the Lizard Man. Oh, you know what that was? It was a don't uh, uh, it was a circus train wreck. How did you know? I was down here uh, investigating a sighting that occurred in 2011 
down by Boggy Creek, and this was one uh, by a girl named Heather Owen, which was in our documentary, and which was also uh, part of the Monsters and Mysteries in America Falk episode. We went down there investigating. Jerry and I were there. And there was a couple of uh, houses nearby. We decided to knock on the door and ask if they had seen anything. We don't usually do that too much. We did. And of course, this guy came out and he said, I don't know, but you know what? It was a circus train wreck. <laughs> there it was. But, but the whole reality of the circus train wreck, there was some tracks and there were some trains that ran down here in Falk. And those were primarily used for the lumber industry. You probably don't know this, but down where Boggy Creek crosses Highway 71, back in the early 1900s, there was a whole other town called Boggy Town that was down there. This whole thing existed. There was even a, they had their own post office, there was people living there, and it was all from the lumbering industry because it, the lumber was taken from here and shipped up to Texarkana by train, and that went out and distributed from Texarkana to all the other places. So there's no, you can't find anything. That whole town is just gone. You could go probably dig around down there and you might take a metal detector and find something cool. But that thing is gone. But that's what the trains were doing. Now, circuses did come by here and there was some, you know, that would uh, come in these areas and move in and out. And some of them were trains. Some of them moved by uh, wagons and, and other, you know, automobiles. The best I could find that there was a circus train wreck in Mena, Arkansas, which I think is 100 miles north of here. There was actually a documented crash of a, of a train that had circus animals on it. So apparently there is, but to my knowledge, I, now I don't know about you, but I've been in some circuses, but I've never seen a seven foot tall, upright, bipedal anthropoid in their circus. They got bears that can ride unicycles, maybe a chimpanzee, no, no creatures fitting the description of Bigfoot. So this whole circus train thing is an urban legend, a rural legend at best. The other thing is, you know Blackburn, you know what that was? That was moonshiners. This whole thing is moonshiners. They were trying to keep people away from their, their stills out in the woods. Well, they did a really bad job of it, because I got a whole room full of people coming to town because it's a monster. The whole moonshiner thing is, you know, it just doesn't seem like something that was manufactured for that purpose. Like one moonshiner one day goes, you know what? I see the cops coming down in this area. You know what, what we could do to get rid of them? No, what's that? Give them Billy Bob? and been a monster. No moonshiner ever thought that up. And even if they did, and they convinced one of them to make a furry suit back in the 1940s or earlier, I've got witnesses who came through here that had sightings of the creature in the 60s that had no preconceived notion about any of this. So if the moonshiners were perpetuating stories down here in the area to keep people out, they were apparently running up and down Highway 71 in suits, which I just don't buy. That's almost more preposterous than Bigfoot itself. It doesn't. It just doesn't add up. And so the moonshiner thing uh, is, is not a, is not explain this. The other is the sundown town. Now, I've heard this, does anybody know what a sundown town is? It, it's an embarrassing part of our American history. Um, it's a racial uh, situation where certain towns said you've got to get out by sundown. They didn't allow certain ethnic groups in. People have told me that that's where the monster came from. Uh, and it was, again, manufactured to keep people out. So again, it's like, you don't need a monster. You already have a bad attitude here and stuff. Nobody wants to come to towns like that if you're not welcome. You don't need a monster. 
does not explain a phenomenon that's been going on for a hundred years of people seeing ape-like creatures down in the Sulphur River bottoms. What does that have to do with our, you know, regretful attitudes that we had at that time in America? It has nothing to do with it. So that's not an explanation. I just don't buy it. Hoax. There's always something. You know my cousin's about monster. Man, your cousin's been busy. Is your cousin like 112 years old? Woo. And I'll tell you, he's a brave guy because I got reports by hunters. There was a crack hunter who was down here and saw something walk right up to the to the deer stand. That's brave because what kind of idiot's going to put on a suit down here, especially back then, and go sneaking up by deer stands? If I'm gonna get these people to freak out. <laughs> They're gonna shoot you. If your cousin's still alive, he ain't about monster. Not buying it. I am not buying it. That's not to say that some sometimes there could have been somebody who dressed up in a suit here and ran across some of these roads. And they may honestly be in my book back there because the witness believed they saw a creature. And again, it was just for mere seconds. And maybe it was dusky and they couldn't quite tell. So I'm not going to say that there hasn't been some hoaxing or, you know, funny games involved with this. In a lot of cryptic cases, this happens where something is going on and then some guys are bored and like, yeah, let's, let's do a monster sighting. But they didn't invent the monster, they're only trying to contribute to it or have fun with it. So I don't think there's any way that this could be a masterful hoax by war kids or moonshiners or anyone else that have kept us up all this long and have fooled everybody. And certainly not Terry Sutton, the guy I talked about in the documentary that saw it at about 60 feet away in it's clearly walking. It didn't look at him because he was on the pond fishing. This thing walked up and over the bank. He observed it close. He goes, it wasn't a person in a suit. It was way back on our private property. He goes, whatever that thing was, I, I can't say what it was other than it was this upright, ape-like looking thing with very long arms, walking somewhat hunched over, walked up and over that bank. I saw it. This guy is an extremely credible witness. I know him, I know his family, I've gotten to know them over the years. That, that documentary was the first time he had ever told that story. So even if that one right there, even if Perry was the only person that 100% saw the fountain monster, it exists. Because I know that wasn't a hoax. You know, and people say, well, it's just a bear. The old bear thing. We all know what a bear looks like. And yes, bears can stand up and bears can walk for a short period of time on their hind legs. But all of these accounts are not bears. Again, maybe there's a few of them where they saw it at a distance and it stood up and they shot its shoulder and thought, I saw the fountain monster. There have been bears up here from time to time. I've even got a picture a few years ago. There was a bear on, on County Road 7. But that, again, just does not explain away the existence of the creature. Certainly, when you have people, especially who live down in Jonesville, these people lived in the woods. A lot of them had to hunt to put food on the table. They know what's out there. They knew the difference between if there was a bear or a mountain lion or an alligator and something that stood upright and looked like to their best description of the real. So I, I just don't buy, I don't buy that either. The mistaken identity and, and certainly, you know, how about mistaken identity in terms of if there was a circus train wreck, for example, you know, that a chimpanzee ran into these woods or something like that. Okay, maybe. But again, people do know the difference in that. 
you know, and, uh, and a lot of the early witnesses would describe it as it looked gorilla-like, or it looked like an ape, but it wasn't an ape. It looked like an ape, but it, it also looked like a man, a wild man. So, you know, we can give some of those mistaken identities to, uh, there were animals that were out of place, animals that shouldn't be in, in the woods that are here. And that could, I mean, it could include orangutans, I suppose. That's come up a few times. Uh, I've heard that in the past where people say they had, red, they had a red coloration. Uh, back in, I want to say, 1st of May, a gentleman that lives here said he had a sighting. Well, as he was driving, he saw something come up and run across the road. He said it looked small, like a juvenile, but he said, to me, it looked like an orangutan. He goes, it was reddish. First, I know the guy's not making this up, because if you're going to make up a falcon monster sighting, you're not going to say, well, I think it looked like an orangutan. You're going to say it was huge, it was big, it walked across the road, you know, it looked at me and kind of said, yeah, yeah. You're not going to make up something like that. So I thought, okay, he just simply saying what he saw. It was reddish in color and it was small. Is there an orangutan out here in the woods? Maybe. It doesn't explain all the sightings, but it could explain a few weird ones, including one I had three weeks ago. This is one of the weirdest things, and I, I really don't know what it is I saw or how to explain it, but I was down at Mercer Bayou with Ashley and Jerry. We come up here to just hang out and do some things. And we were down there. It was daytime, and we were standing at the end of the boat ramp looking at the water levels. And I looked over, and there's, there's a couple of cypress trees that are there, and the same ones you see in the Swamp Stalker Monster Quest episode. And we were carrying out, oh, there's the trees. And I, I was looking at something caught my eye, a shadow. And at first, it kind of looks like something walked between some trees about 100 yards away. And then I, then I began looking, and I saw another shadow. And I thought, I, I think it's the way the tree leaves are moving, and it's casting a shadow, because there was a little bit of wind. And I thought, yeah, it caught my eye. And why did it catch my eye? Because it moved. It's like we talked about earlier. I saw the movement. I wasn't, you know, I was like, man, that would be cool if it was one of the creatures, but I can't for sure say it was. It could have been a trick of light and shadows. So I'm looking there, then I see about 20 yards behind that, I see this dark reddish thing move. Not upright, not walking, but just, I saw the bulk of the shape move right across that same eye line where I was looking. And I was like, I just saw some kind of red thing move across there. And this, I'm standing at the edge of the water the other side of the water goes into the woods. There's no roads over there. There's no nothing. It just goes into the bayou woodlands. There's no roads back there. I mean, it wasn't a, a bright red van or some of the bizarre thing. It wasn't a weather balloon, as the UFO <laughs> people would say. I don't really know what it was. And I won't say that. I won't say I saw the Bout monster because I can't completely say that it was something like that. I might say I, I saw the falcon orangutan, possibly, but I thought it was ironic that I would just up at the Monster Mart listen to a guy say he saw a reddish thing run across the road. Very clearly, it was an ape-like thing. And then I'm looking and I see something that's red. I wish I would have, you know, seen it closer. And we we couldn't really investigate it because we didn't have a boat and we could not get across the channel. It's too deep and there's alligators in there. And, I tried to get Jerry to go across, and he wouldn't do it. We really couldn't get over there to investigate, so um, I don't know. It, it, was, it was mysterious and strange. So what, it, what is it? If the Fount Monster exists, what is, what, what is this in reality? What is that thing? You know, an undiscovered primate? That's kind of the theories that most people assume and where Bigfoot research kind of started was that this is some kind of species of ape, a great ape, that has 
not yet been documented, not yet proven or, uh, you know, it's out there. Just like the mountain gorillas were back in the early 1900s. They became, you know, ultimately were proven. Is it something like that? Perhaps. I kind of operate under that theory. I'm still like old school Bigfoot, man. We're looking for this strange ape out in the woods. And when we prove it, it'll be this species of a derivative of, of, of great apes that we know or another branch of anthropoid. Is it a surviving hominid? Something much closer to man? You know, descendants of Homo erectus. The, uh, you know, australopithecine, uh, something like that, something that's the branch of our own lineage, something that survived. You know, early on people said, well, it's the Bigfoot is the missing link or something like that, where, uh, you know, or it's Neanderthals that have survived. And those are antiquated ways of thinking about it now. You know, we don't think in terms of missing links. We realize that the the divergency of, of the development of our own species as well as its ape populations is vast and bushy and the tree just is on and on as we discover things in the fossil record. People go, well, this Bigfoot can't exist because we don't find it in the fossil record. Well, a decade ago you could have said that about chimpanzees because there was no record of chimpanzees in the fossil record. That was only found recently. We actually found, we, but we know they exist. So you can't use that argument, certainly. You can't use that there's no fossil. Because to form a fossil takes just the right conditions and luck to get one. And that's why we only have a few fossils of, of some things that uh, are documented as species. So we don't know if, if, if the creature out there is related to us or not. Is it something else? Is it something more paranormal? I talked about the supernatural aspects that people uh, apply to this, which I think, you know, you're underestimating animals. Man, animals are amazing. Look at what chameleons can do. Look at the intelligence of octopus, things like that. We can't, we can't, uh, you know, cut them short on the credit they deserve. Is it something from another dimension? The Bermuda Triangle. I don't know. You know, people say, well, they come from portals, they're coming from another dimension. You know, you know, I say, well, okay, my mind's open to whatever. I can't prove I can't prove it one way or another, but but you know, how come the portals are always coincidentally in the best areas where you would find a large creature, a large terrestrial apex predator. Because when you line up the Bigfoot sightings, they're, they're in the prime areas, like right here. All the sightings down here make perfect sense because we, we, we talked about the habitat and how something could live here. If it was a portal, I could just sit on my front porch back down in Texas in city and just hope one will pop out on the street. Because if you're in a portal, why do you need to be popping out in the woods? You can pop out a Walmart parking lot. Now, I mean, of course, yeah, I've seen some dudes that I thought popped out of portals at Walmart, but it, it wasn't about monster. So I don't buy into much of that, though I don't really know. How many of these things are down there? Well, we have to presume there's got to be a small population. There has to be enough to perpetuate its existence. Just like Bigfoot, there's not just one foul monster, you know, that's 100 years old walking around. There's probably a population, and I know that because I've talked to witnesses who said they saw various colors, various heights. A woman saw something several years ago north of the Sulphur River, and she said it stood five feet tall. She saw it clearly in daylight at 10 a.m. as she turned her car around and had to head back. And she asked me, she goes, I thought the things would be bigger. I said, well, ma'am, think about it in terms of reality. They would grow up. They were born. So if you saw one at, 
you know, 15 years old, I don't know, it's five foot high. The adults would be, she's like, I never thought of that. You know, she just it was a casual person that just knew about the foul monster. But in reality, there has to be a population that continues on. So, and how many of that is, it's anyone's guess. You know, they say you need, you know, we need 750 or 1,000 or something at least for them to be, survive, to interbreed, you know, and things like that. So, so there could be, in this general where we talked about the Caddo Triangle and beyond, there could be a 1,000 of these creatures out there, and that's it, which isn't very many. We talk about the square miles, a thousand creatures isn't that much. Think about how many bears there are, and then think about how many bears you see in the wild. Hardly any. Have any of you guys ever seen a bear in the wild? Okay. So they're out there, and if you see one, you're, you're lucky. But there's many, many, many more bears than there are of these creatures. Are they nomadic? I think they move around. I don't think they're nomads like, well, let's pack up the tent. Now we're moving, you know, to the Serengeti next week. Not like that. But they, they do certainly would move around to the areas that are advantageous to their survival and where they want to go and where it's best to stay out of the sights of hunters and to stay away from campers at certain times of the year, to go where the game is plentiful things like that. They, they must move around. But ultimately, all of this speculation and proof will be the answer. If we have a body of one of these, and I'm not saying we go out and try to harvest one or anything, I'm just saying that if we did, and if, however that happens, then all these answers can be proven. It's like, well, there it is. We, it answers all this stuff. So, you know, that's interesting and people say, oh man, what, ha what if that happens? And are you going to be disappointed or happy? I was like, it's all good to me. You know, if you prove them, that's great. If we don't, that's cool too. I enjoy this whole mystery. You know, I may not ever know the answers. I may be like Smokey Crabtree and spend my life trying to find those answers, but at least I'm having fun along the way and being part of the legend. And if you look at this now, what is the Fout Monster? In some ways, it, it does exist. It really does exist. We're here talking about it. Is it, we don't have a physical specimen, but look at this. The celebration and, and the notoriety of this, and the popularity of this. People come from all over the world to just drop by the Monster Mart and go, Wow, look at this, you know, where's Boggy Creek? What can I see? You know, maybe I'm going to go down in the woods. That's a phenomenon. And if they come here for that, in, in some ways, that legend is real. And it's as real as they want it to be. And it's cool to be a part of that. And certainly, every single one of you now are a part of this legend. You came here. Several years later, you know, people are like, oh yeah, I want to go to that Fout Monster Festival. People go to that, you know. You went to that, you're here. You're like literally part of the legend. And I feel honored that, you know, I went to the Monster Mart when I first started this. It didn't look anything like this. It was a crummy looking store. I walked in there expecting to see this awesome display and I see a few old newspaper articles hanging up on a cork board flapping it every time somebody opened the door. <laughs> like, valuable historical things. Flapping their tail. There's a case over there with a little bit of smoky crabtree stuff, and that was it. I'm like, are you kidding me? Thousands of people love this movie. This is all? And then uh, that's when I started setting out, well, I'm going to write a book, and, and this will be cool. And, and years later, you come here, and now it, it's you know, we, it, it's it's come back to life. And we're celebrating in terms of Bigfoot, and now you can see the monster march. So it's very cool um, that the legend has continued and gone on and on to what it is now. So 
you know, in, in closing, this is something that, that, that will continue on. And if you're ever driving down in our country along about sundown, keep an eye on the dark woods as you cross the Sulphur River bottoms. You may catch a glimpse of a huge, hairy creature watching you from the shadows. And you know that next person that sees the foul monster could be you. I'm Lyle Blackburn. Thank you.